Hi, I'm Cliff, and this is my garage, and it's time to pump up the volume, pump up the volume, pump up the volume. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hey, welcome back to The Garage, and if this is your first time joining me, thanks for dropping by. Okay, this is the moment I've been waiting for. As you can see, I've already removed the Carnival exhaust. For detailed instructions on how to remove a stock exhaust, just refer to the Carnival install video that I did. I'll put a suggested video link up here in the corner of the screen. Okay, let's take this thing over to the table and get it unboxed. Okay. Let's open this up. This is like Christmas, but better, actually. Where's the seam? There we go. I think I'm in the seam. I don't want to dig in too hard because I don't want to cut into the, well, the contents of the box. Now let's see what we got here. not scrimp on packing materials. So we have assembly hardware. Looks like it's plated. Some of it's plated. Some of it looks like stainless steel. A lot of it looks like stainless steel. Okay. What we got here? I think. Yeah. This I asked them to send me a banner that I could hang up in the garage, so that's going to be a sole performance banner. That's cool. And, oh, t-shirts. All right. Hey, you know, maybe we could do a giveaway on these. How's that sound? All right, that feels like some sort of a bracket bracket and these oh okay more brackets ow so much bubble wrap okay this is yeah this is the valve controller kit this is going to be the remote controls and the tubing and such. This is like what lets you control the valves, open and close them. Okay. That's probably going to be the hardest part of the whole install is doing that. Man, I'm glad I don't have to repackage this. I'm not sure I'd figure out how to get it all back in here again. So this is going to be one of the side pipes and a muffler. Okay. Hmm. Where am I going to put this? I'll just set this one to the side. Take a closer look at the other one. I do with my box knife. There. Very carefully cut this loose. Okay, so there's one of the valves. Ooh, let me be careful. That's kind of delicate looking. OK, 
Okay. Now here you can see this is the uh, the actual valve. It's a vacuum controlled valve, and when it actuates, it opens up a butterfly valve here. Now I'm not sure which is which based on the flow. I'm guessing that, that this is the open path where it's basically a straight shot to the outlet here. And when you're closed, it blocks this, or when it's, yeah, when it's off, it blocks this off and forces through a less efficient route. That's why, you know, it doesn't hurt to have a T-bend or a T-joint here. You're not looking for maximum efficiency in this path. This route's through the muffler. Okay, that makes sense. Very careful. Okay. All right, there we go. There's one side. And no need to unwrap the other side on camera. I think we're ready to go and start installing this. Getting the actual muffler itself on is going to be, I think, pretty pretty trivial. It's uh, getting these valves connected. Let's see here. Just taking a look. That's going to be coming over. So this is the left hand side. And hmm. I'm just looking at this angle here. I'm not sure how this fits together. But I I'll, I'll take a look at it. Um, one thing I am noticing is that this um, connector for the vacuum line is on top. So that's going to be, I mean, I can see you want it on top away from anything that could hit it. But we'll have to wait and see when I get it actually installed because that could be kind of hard to get up to and get the, um, get the hose onto it. I might want to put the hose on before I actually, like, install it. Well, we'll see when we actually install it. I finished unpacking everything. Uh, they do, it's not kind of nice, they do include new gaskets for you. These are the brackets that attach to the factory um, mounting points for the exhaust. And then if I'm reading the directions correctly, these clamps go through here and clamp around the exhaust pipe. Uh, like I was showing before, here are the vacuum lines and all the other parts, the controllers. This is the actual vacuum valve. And uh, that's, I believe this is the remote receiver. And that's all for the, the, the uh, vacuum controller. Okay. Uh, Sol says the first step is to put all the, put the X pipe together with the mufflers and the pipes and then put it onto the car. So uh, it's kind of like the same way I did with the Carnival system. Now, one thing you'll probably notice is that the original or the X pipe that I got with the Carnival exhaust, it's got uh, like 700 miles on it now, including a track day where it, you know, apparently got pretty hot. And, you, know, you can see that it and the tips have discolored to this sort of a, a bronzy gold color. And Sol tells me that this is, this is perfectly normal, especially on a tracked car where it gets much hotter than normal. And, you know, I'm fine with, I presume that this is all going to do the same thing. I'm fine with that. I got no problem with it, except for the tips themselves. I don't really care for this look, but I talked with Sol and uh, they're going to send me some titanium tips instead. And the titanium I've seen, I've, I've seen before where the titanium discolors to like a, a purpley blue kind of pattern that would actually look kind of nice against the blue car. This gold, to me, just looked kind of odd. It's not super bad. It's not like I'm totally distraught and I hate it. I just, I just uh, would have preferred silver, but titanium when a purpley blue. I think that's going to be fine. I'm going to install it with these tips right now and get it working. And then, when, I don't know, in a week or so, when Sol gets me the titanium, I'll swap them out. 
Now the X pipe is just sort of loosely installed and just, uh, I'm gonna tighten it up a little bit just to give it enough uh, rigidity to handle. This is nowhere near in the final position. That'll all be done once it's installed on the car. All right, we're gonna do this just like we did the stock and the Carnival exhausts. Just pick this up by hand and yeah, second person would definitely help. I'm having trouble getting the valves in. Wow, this uh, this is much tougher to fit. Uh, okay, well that's nice. Uh, it's a little shaky, but the the flanges of the clamp here sit on this brace, and give you a place to catch your breath. Now I'm going to take and work the, uh, the, the exhaust manifold stud into this flange. Got it braced. I'm going to real quick. Uh, let's see. I'm going to take a quick. I'm going to put a nut on here so that it doesn't come off on me. This is a lesson I learned during the Carnival install. Just loosely on there. Now, just do the same thing over here. Hmm. Can't get it to reach. Why? The clamps are hitting this. I'm thinking I need to loosen those clamps up and rotate them so that they're down here on the bottom. Now the problem is getting it to move where I can get Oops, that's tightening. I swing it all the way around 360 degrees. Get that one in place. Now, loosen up the other one. Unfortunately, that means I'm going to lose my brace to help hold this. Ah, that is not wanting to turn. Ah, there, I had to. Ah, getting it loose enough is. It's like the bolt is loose, but the clamp itself doesn't want to open up enough. I'm trying to work it past that brace there. Got that now. And I still have trouble getting it onto that stud. Okay. Finally got it. I'm gonna get a nut on there. I think the problem is I've got the mufflers in too tight on the X pipe, maybe. I think it's just a question if it's just not quite lined up the way it's supposed to be. Okay, let's see what we can do here. Yeah, the X now the X pipe just keeps hitting. The X pipe keeps hitting. Yeah, the X-Pipe is now down below that brace at the back of the transmission. Now, I've got to take this bolt back off and get it up above there. There. Now it's on top. Uh.
Ah. Came off the stud again, but I got it back. Yeah, it's tough. I'm having trouble reaching past the half axle here, or the half shaft, to get this nut on. Oh, yeah, two person job, definite. Far easier with two people. Okay, let's see how this is looking. Okay, now it's finally settling up in there the way it should. And yeah, I can see where those hoses are gonna be a giant pain in the butt to get on once this is installed. All right, so we're back in the garage the next day and I've spent quite a while this morning figuring out these brackets and the confusion comes from the, um, the way the instructions are printed because the instructions show, in one photo they show the bracket installed on the, this face, in the other photo they show it installed on the other face. And so I ultimately determined you could do it either way, Just you just have to assemble the bracket differently. And like this one will fit on the back here, but if I want to put it on the front, I have to move this bracket to the other side. So I'm doing it on the back. Also, another note on the, um, on the instructions, as soon as you get, or even before, as soon as you place the order, don't worry about these instructions. Go download the PDF. Um, the, 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 print, the photos printed out here, are just, they're really hard to see. They're, they, they, don't, don't, they just didn't print out well. They're much clearer and much easier to work with when you're looking at the PDF. Uh, that you download from the website. So just definitely go that route. Okay, so we're going to put this piece on here. The up angled holes go to the outside and you can't really put this on wrong. Now this is kind of a pain. I'm wondering if it would have been easier to put these brackets on first, uh, but the instructions said put the um, the muffler system in first so I'm presuming there's a reason for it but trying to reach back here and get these nuts on is well it's a pain let's get this finger tight and then this other piece, like I was saying before, this, this loop goes forward. Or another way to look at it is this little ear goes downward and you split it open and it goes on either side of the bracket we just put in. Ah. Just try to get your hands in here is often the challenge. All right, there. And what happens is that this butts up against this pipe here, and then a clamp goes around the whole thing. And uh, one thing I should mention is that by the time you get this up in here, the valve is very close to the underside of the car. And so I went ahead and installed the lines on each one of the valves, because I think it would be extremely difficult if you do that after this is all in place. Based on my experience on the other side, this is the worst part of the installation, and that's to get this clamp on here. You have to get the clamp around the pipe and around this brace, and then clamp it together. The problem, or what makes this such a challenge, is that this is a captive bolt. 
and it's um this little spacer piece here is the the bolt is driven through it and it's got like little splines to hold it in place and so you can't just remove this bolt and fit it around put the bolt back in now what you got to do is bend this thing open fit it around and then bend it closed again and i found it extremely difficult bending it closed enough to get the nut on it and uh so let me just do this one and I'll show you how I finally figured out how to do this and hopefully it works the second time. Bending it open by hand is really not hard at all. And getting it most of the way bent back closed isn't tough. It's just this last part trying to get this pulled tight enough to where you can get this bolt through far enough to get this spacer, this washer, and then the nut onto that bolt. So what I, after much trial and error, what I came up with is using a huge adjustable wrench to get hold of this thing and clamping it shut. Not adjustable wrench, adjustable pliers. And the difficulty again is just getting it, getting hold of it. Ah, oh, I, I would really like to see Soul redesign this clamp in some way that makes it, I don't know, put a hinge in this thing or something. Cause man, is this a pain in the butt. Tried using a C clamp, that didn't work at all. For reasons I don't really feel like going into right now. Oh my God, so fresh. I mean, admittedly, this would be a whole lot easier with two people. Then, oh, it just keeps slipping off. Another challenge is getting hold of it and pulling it together enough and still being able to get the, um, uh, the spacer and everything on because the pliers get in the way. I did it successfully on the other side. Question is, can I do it again? Yeah, I see the pliers in the way. I can't get it on there. Good Lord, I can't figure out how I did it before. Hmm. Now I'm getting it squashed, but the top part is not being pushed in enough. Again, I think by the time I get this spacer thing on there, yeah, they're still not in, it's not, not in deep enough. Yeah, this is what I went through with it the last time. And uh, I mean, it took me like 30 minutes to get this thing put back together and extremely frustrating to the point where I was ready to give up and just chuck this thing in the garbage. 
yeah, I can't, even, I can't even get this to go together because I think partly because this is not coming up against here and this is just not going back together right. Let me pause the video, see if I can figure this out uh, before I start saying bad words. Just a lot of finagling and irritation. This is like 15 minutes later. Finally got hold of it with the pliers and kind of bent it some more to where I can sort of close this down a lot more by hand. So let's get this on here. The trick is really going to be, can I, even when I get it down, can I get the nut on it? There, now I'm kind of squeezing on the top of my fingers, pushing on the bottom of the nut with this hand. There, I got the threads to catch. Oh my Lord, what a pain. Um, this is just not a good way to do this. That, there is no, I don't think there's any reason that bolt can't be free, that it has to have that, um, to where you have to bend the crap out of this to get it open and around there. And if it sounds like I'm irritated, that's exactly right. Uh, don't even... Well, I just did... It's not really tight yet, it just gets jammed up, the threads in there. Okay. Oh, Lord. One of the hardest things to do in the installation process was holding up the exhaust system so that I could tighten these uh, brackets. And it was kind of a pain because it was tough to try to hold it with one hand tighten the bracket and then not have it just sag back down. You needed to push the exhaust almost all the way up in there. So I solved that by using a two by four and my always handy hydraulic table to hold the thing up in place. Well, to, to push it up in place and then I could tighten it up and everything was good. Ah. Okay, so then the last step, after getting the clamps from hell on, was to start at the exhaust flanges, tightening everything up, and uh, basically do the exhaust flanges, then the brackets and the uh, clamp that holds the pipe to the bracket, and then you end with the the um, the exhaust tips. And be aware that there is a torque spec on this bracket of uh, I think minimum 18 pounds. I said. I tightened it far beyond that. 18 pounds just didn't seem like very much. And then this clamp here is 40 foot pounds, which takes a long time to get to because there's a lot of pull up that happens um, in this thing. I, I ended up doing a lot of it with the impact driver, tightening out pretty good, and then finishing off to 40 foot pounds with the torque wrench. So now I'm gonna lower the core down some and uh, adjust this tip. So our last task is to get these tips centered up. I've got the clamps loose. Um, and it looks like they're a little bit too far that way. So wiggle these, push them to the side. It doesn't look to have moved at all. Okay, yeah, that's better. I kind of push these up a bit. Actually, I think I'll pull them down here like that. The uh, the sole system seems to to sit lower than the stock exhaust. I probably could push that up. Well, no, not really. Really couldn't push up any very much at all. The problem is in the, the problem is in the, the valve that sits over in this corner. Um, I don't know why, but the uh, 
the little stem for the um, for the vacuum line pokes straight up in that direction. I don't know why it's clocked that way, but that's a about the worst possible position it could be in, in terms of running into things and, and making it difficult to get the, the valve stem on there, or not the valve stem, getting the, uh, the vacuum line on there. So I don't know why. I guess that's probably just something inherent in the design of the, uh, the valve that they have to do it that way, but it's kind of a pain. The bottom line is I don't think this could actually get any higher up in the car without crushing that that hose. No, there's probably maybe a half an inch clearance tops. Okay, so we're going to go with that. It's probably, in all honesty, not even noticeable whatsoever, this gap. And, and you know, really, I think actually that's fine because the gap above is about the same as on the sides. So that looks pretty good. Yeah, yeah, I think that I'm happy with that. So now it's just a question of tightening up all the clamps on this part here, and uh, we'll be done and ready to do a small test, I think. So all we gotta do is tighten up these clamps, and uh, we're done with this part of the installation. Four to six weeks later. Okay, it's been about a month since I installed the sole exhaust. Now, the reason I didn't record the installation of the vacuum lines and the vacuum controller is because there is no set way to do it. And it also involved a lot of finagling and figuring and floundering around in really tight places that it was virtually impossible to get a camera in for you to watch what I was doing. And, Actually seeing me tucking the lines in is probably not valuable at all versus seeing where I tucked them in. And that's going to be a lot easier to do now that uh, I've got it all in place. Also, I wasn't sure that what I had decided to do was going to hold up. In other words, where I tucked these lines, would it stay in place? Would it stay attached? Would there be some kind of problems? And so I decided to just forget it get it installed, spend a while testing it and making sure that it actually worked, and then show you what I ended up with once I was sure I wasn't sending you off on a bad path. One thing I strongly recommend is to install the vacuum lines before you put in the exhaust. And I mean after you take out the old exhaust so you've got lots of room to work. I found myself constantly fighting to try and work around the exhaust system already in place to put the vacuum lines in and it got really, really frustrating. And I found myself wishing constantly that I had done all this before I put the actual exhaust in. So that's one recommendation I've got for you is put in the vacuum lines first. In fact, even go as far as go ahead and install the vacuum controller first to make sure you've got it all working before you put the exhaust in. So I got everything installed and working and then the very next morning my son and I went and spent a weekend at a, men, a church men's retreat. Had a great time and uh, so we put about uh, 300 miles on the exhaust and then about a week and a half later my wife and I celebrated our 25th anniversary by spending a week up in Helen, Georgia. So the car also took a round trip up to there and back. So I put about 1,500 miles on the exhaust and uh, giving the, the ECU a chance to adjust, making sure that everything that I installed was going to stay where I installed it and everything was going to stay hooked up. So it's had a pretty good shakedown run. I'm confident in what I did. So let me grab the GoPro and show you exactly how I installed this. So starting here on the driver's side, you can see the, uh, the vacuum line is connected here to the valve. This is a very tight fit. Uh, and then it goes up behind this heat shield right here. And you can see how I was talking about how this is kind of a pain to do with this, uh, this uh, exhaust system in the way. But it goes across and it just runs behind that heat shield all the way across and exits on the other side there. And then the, we have a short piece of vacuum line here connected to the other valve, which loops around 
and connects up with the other one here through a T fitting. And from there, the vacuum line goes on around and I took and removed the nut that holds this heat shield in place and used one of these little clip things here. Oh, good Lord, the, uh, the name of this escapes me at the moment. I just took with the tab of it and kind of screwed it onto the stud that pokes out and then uh, kind of put the um, put the valve, uh, the vacuum light in it and kind of tucked it in place. And it's held up just fine through the, the 1,500 miles. From there, the line continues on through here. And this is the kind of tough part to see, I think. Okay, it goes underneath this heat shield. And I took a pair of uh, needle nose pliers and bent the metal back. This is really thin aluminum, so it's easy to do. But I just took and kind of curled this back so that I wouldn't have any sharp edges coming into contact with the vacuum line. And it just goes through here a short distance. This is just kind of to hold it up and exits the other side of the heat shield right here. And again, you can see that I took and uh, it's not the prettiest job, but I kind of rounded this edge of this heel shield, which was rather sharp, so that, again, it, I had no danger of nicking and cutting the vacuum line. Okay. Then the line continued up on through here, and this is the PDK shift cable. And this part doesn't move here that I've attached it to. Uh, over here, this is the part that slides in and out and does the shifting shift selection on the PDK. I just use a, a wire tie, which I will plan to cut that off, and then from there, it follows that cable up and into the engine. And what I did was I took and uh, got the cable kind of partway up there and then used one of those clawed parts connectors to reach up through there and poke it up through the engine bay and get it to where I could reach it from the top. Now here in the engine compartment, here is the PDK shift transmission or shift cable. Uh, there's going to be an equivalent one from the manual. And if you look down, you can see where the vacuum hose is coming up along it, and I've got it attached there. From there, it goes over into the actual controller, which is mounted down here. Uh, from there, the vacuum line is going into the solenoid. From there, the, the next section of vacuum line comes off of there, and I've got, go got it going across through the check valve down here and over into this area. Now, this vacuum line right here originally connected with a short piece of hose to this solenoid down here, what I presume is a solenoid. What I did was I took and got rid of that short segment of hose in there, and then I teed this off so that the, uh, the vacuum source here is connected to the T. That section of the hose feeds the original uh, destination of the vacuum. And then now it's teed off and this is now going over towards the, um, the vacuum or the valve control system. The valve control system is a kind of a pain in the butt because there is no specific place to mount it. And I didn't want to do it quite the way that Soul was showing, which was just to kind of have it laying over here or zip tied or something. Because I would like to eventually put on a clear engine cover. And uh, so what I did was I took and made a little mounting plate here. And then used a bolt to connect it to an unused uh, tapped hole or tapped mounting point that's built right onto the intake runner here. So this little piece of aluminum, it's eighth inch aluminum, holds both the remote valve controller or the remote, the remote control system, the remote receiver, I think, yeah, the remote receiver, that's what this thing is, and the solenoid. Getting this in place, major pain in the butt. Be prepared to, uh, to do a lot of wiggling and finagling and uh, just bring your best calm demeanor because trying to work in here is not fun. And now it's time to answer the question that I'm sure almost all of you are the most curious about. How does it sound? Well, in a word, glorious.
I absolutely love the sound of his exhaust. Let's go check it out.
I think you see the answer to the question is it sounds great. I absolutely love the sound of this soul exhaust. Now, I've gone and reviewed the video already, and I can tell you the videos just don't do justice to how good this exhaust system sounds. Um, one thing that really didn't come across and didn't get captured was its tendency to kind of uh, burble and crackle a little bit when you come off the accelerator, whether you're downshifting or just you're reaching your speed. Um, a lot of times on an upshift, it'll do it a little bit. And it's, it's really noticeable from inside the cabin. And I just, it's a, it's a cool little thing that I really, really like about the Soul Exhaust. We've answered one question, which is how does it sound? But the other big question is, how does it perform? And that's where things got a little weird. When I did my performance testing, I was getting back some answers that didn't make sense. Mainly that by putting on the Soul Exhaust, I was losing five to 10 horsepower. And that, honestly made no sense at all because subjectively I could tell that the car was pulling stronger, that it had a bit more power. And so I really started looking into it a little more closely, looking at the data and the patterns. And also something I noticed when I was doing my performance testing this time. One thing is I've noticed the tendency for there to be a variation in how the PDK transmission engages. Sometimes it's a very quick initial start. Other times it, it gets to rolling a bit, which would trigger the, uh, the Drakey performance monitor. And then it seems to catch it. It's not a big difference, but it's certainly enough to make a one or two tenths of a second difference. And so what I've done is I've gone back and looking at the data and I've been throwing away those oddball high numbers that would come up every so often. And that made a big difference in the calculations. And in the future, my plan is to use launch control instead. And what I found was in some testing, launch control was much, much more consistent in uh, producing the are very close to the same numbers when repeated on the same stretch of road. Now, the other thing that I basically screwed up on building my initial mathematical model to compute horsepower gains, horsepower gains, not horsepower gains, horsepower gains was that I discounted the effect of relative humidity and barometric pressure. And what I found in doing more research was that they have a far bigger effect on engine power than I had assumed. So a couple things. One, I went back and rebuilt my mathematical model to allow relative humidity and barometric pressure to be input into the model. I also went back and I Luckily, I've got barometric pressure and relative humidity data in addition to temperature for the days that I did testing previously and went back and redid my computations for the Carnival exhaust. And what I found was, for one, recomputing the model found that the Carnival exhaust, it gave a nice little uh, change in the tone of the exhaust. Carnival exhaust sounds really, really good. But when I redid the calculations for horsepower, I found that it instead of giving six horsepower, the new model said that the horsepower increase was exactly 0, 0.0 horsepower. In other words, the Carnival exhaust gave no difference whatsoever in terms of horsepower, which, if you'll recall, aligned with my subjective observations at the time was, I really wasn't sure I could feel any difference at all. Now, applying the same changes, throwing out the oddball high readings or high time measurements, and inputting relative humidity and barometric pressure into the calculations, now my model was saying that uh, in comparison to both the stock and, of course, now the Carnival exhaust, I was getting around a three and a half horsepower increase 
from the soul exhaust, which now lines up with my subjective feelings that yes, there is a performance bump. It wasn't huge, but I felt, yeah, I can definitely feel the car is pulling stronger. It's accelerating harder. And well, it sounded a heck of a lot better too. So bottom line, and I'm going to have to go back and make another video um, amending my review on the Carnival. The, you're not going to get a big performance gain on a 987.2 by changing the cat back exhaust. Now, on the 987.1, you're going to get a substantial bump because the 987.1 had secondary catalytic converters in the back half of the exhaust. The 987.2 got rid of those. And so you're simply not going to get huge performance gains at all, no matter how well uh, you design the... Um, the cap back exhaust, I'd be surprised if you saw anything more, even if you went to straight pipes. So a three and a half horsepower gain, that's pretty good, even though it's not that big of a gain. I expect to see much bigger gains when I put in the catless race headers since, well, they're catless. They have no catalytic converters in them. One thing that surprised me a little bit was how big of a difference the closed valves makes. Now, in terms of the cabin noise, it's not that big of a difference. When you've got them closed and you're driving along, when you open up, the, the increase in volume in the cabin is minuscule at most. But outside the car, the difference is quite dramatic. Another sound question that comes up a lot is, does the exhaust drone? And if you don't know what drone is, it's kind of a a resonant sound that an exhaust can make at certain RPMs, and it can be really, really irritating. Now, yes, the sole exhaust does drone, but only under a very, very minor or very small set of circumstances. And, and that is, if you're between two and 3,000 RPM and you're cruising along, and you try to accelerate, you do get some drone. Now, I'm, not, I'm hesitant to even call it droning at all. Um, I find the sound perfectly um, tolerable, more than tolerable. I barely notice it. My wife, however, found it a bit irritating. And so the, do keep that in mind. On the other hand, if you're cruising along and you're a seventh gear and you want to accelerate, just downshift. And the problem is gone. And you know, you're going to accelerate faster anyway. So I did I have to say, yes, there are circumstances where it does drone, but it's a trivial circumstance and easily remedied. One thing I think I forgot to mention when I was talking about the valve controller and opening and closing the valves on the exhaust is how you do it. And it's done with this little remote. Uh, Soul Performance provides two of these remotes with the exhaust. There's one button that opens the valves and one button that closes the valves. What's really nice is that this remote is Homelink compatible, which means that the uh, little buttons above up by the uh, the dome light in the Cayman that you can program to control your uh, your garage doors. Those are Homelink compatible transmitters. So you can reprogram those buttons to use the same frequencies that will open and close your valves on your exhaust. And so it's super simple. You want to open or close your valves, you just reach up and punch one of those two buttons, whichever one you program for which. And the third button is the one that opens my garage door. Now, this won't work, of course, if you've already got, if you've got multiple garage door openers that you have to, that you've already programmed those for. But as long as you've got two buttons free, and I think most of us do, uh, just reprogram it to work like this remote, and then I just keep this remote in the glove compartment as an emergency backup. 
the elevator pitch version of my review of the Soul Exhaust. It sounds great. It sounds so very, very aggressive. Just what I was wanting out of it. When you close down the valves, it becomes much more tame. Uh, but, you know, I don't really care for that sound. I leave the valves open 99% of the time. The only time I close it is if I'm uh, someplace that I'm afraid that I'm going to get a little too much attention from the noise. And even then, I don't think that would happen because even though it sounds really good, it's not that obnoxiously loud. When I take the next step and put the Catless headers on, then I think I reached the level of obnoxious that I really, really want. Uh, in terms of performance, it's not huge, but it's definitely there and you can feel it. But the primary reason you would want to install the Soul Catback Exhaust, the valve version, is the sound. It sounds really, really good. And then there is a dramatic difference when you stop those valves down. Uh, it becomes a much much quieter, milder version of itself. Now, before you go, go down there, smash that like button, feed that YouTube algorithm. It helps out so much with growing the channel here on YouTube. And while you're down there, if you're not one of my 3,500 subscribers, go click on that big red subscribe button and join the channel. It doesn't cost a thing and it doesn't hurt a bit. And finally, if you want to keep up with everything that I'm doing here on Project 987.2, like the new Catless race headers that are going in next, go down there and click on that bell icon. That turns on notifications for this channel. Now, that doesn't mean you'll be getting any uh, emails. You're not going to be getting any text messages. All that's going to happen is that YouTube is going to use that little notification icon up there to let you know every time that I post something new from here in Cliff's Garage. I'll see you next time.